All right, thank you uh, very much for joining us for this session. I'm Tom Gerdy. I'm communications director on the staff of MIT Nano, helping to launch the facility with Vladimir, Brian, and the rest of the team. Um, and I'm really happy to help with the discussion here in this session at the end of the day. We're here to talk about sensing technology and society. And in my role at MIT Nano, I'm often the interface with the public when people come in for tours or if we have to think about the information that we need to share. And I get a pretty good perspective on what I like to call the civilians uh, respond to. And it's often at the societal level, especially once they begin to understand the potential that nanotechnology has in particular to uh, shape tomorrow. Uh, they go very quickly from sort of the technical, which is harder for them to understand, up to, well, what are the implications of that for me? Um, and I think this session will touch upon that in, in a couple of different ways. We have a pretty good cross-section here. Uh, we have people who uh, uh, study and are experts in manufacturing. We have a research scientist who uses the tools for his research, but also to share the results of his research. And two, three, two people plus one hand-standing person uh, <laughs> who are building facilities or have built facilities that allow people to use AR, VR sensors um, for both research and education. Um, so, I think we'll start with some introductions. Some of the panelists you know, but I'll give the panelists who haven't had a chance to talk yet uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. So you know Brian and Admir, but maybe we can start uh, at the far end with Megan, and you can tell them a little bit about uh, your role and what brings you to the conference. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Megan Roberts. I am the Assistant Director of User Services for the Immersion Lab at MIT Nano. So, I've been heavily involved with setting up that facility, and I do hope that all of you will come and visit for the sneak peek tomorrow and Wednesday, 10 to 5, in Building 12, room 3207. We'd really like to show you guys what we're working on and get feedback on um, what you'd like to see in the future in that space and where you think things are going. Um, I did my PhD at MIT, spent a lot of time in MTL, which is MIT Nano's predecessor, um, and my, the focus for my PhD research was wearable sensing, and um, yeah, I guess we'll talk more later. <laughs> yeah, she's been, and yeah. she's been very busy. <laughs> uh, Russ Gant joins us from both MIT and Harvard. Russ, do you want to tell me a little yes, bit? Yes, um, I'm Russ Gant. I run the Visualization Research and Teaching Laboratory at Harvard. Also a um, fellow at uh, CMS here at MIT and working with the uh, Nano Immersion Lab team on bringing their system online. Um, I've been doing what we now think of as AR, VR, MR, XR, the whole sort of um, alphabet soup now since uh, 1979 when I first started at MIT um, developing these um, new generation of uh, visualization capabilities. Um, they have in many ways evolved over the last 40 years, and in other ways they are pretty much the same. And um, as we'll talk a bit more, um, the lab I've been running at Harvard for the last 10 years has really been looking at two areas, um, one research and one teaching, um, particularly focused on science and um, particularly undergraduate science. How do you take these evolving new technologies and apply them to research groups to give them more tools to work with to do their day-to-day -day work? And then how do you move the tools um, out and down into the teaching community? Um, and we can talk more about that. Great. Um, we're really fortunate to have Russ's help uh, setting up a facility since he's done a fantastic job getting Harvard to where they are today. Uh, Liz Reynolds is um, the executive director of the Work of the Future Task Force at MIT. Yeah, um, good afternoon. Um, Liz Reynolds, I'm a principal research scientist and a lecturer in urban studies and planning as well as the director of MIT's Industrial Performance Center. And I'll be talking a little bit about this new initiative that we launched uh, about a year plus ago at the bequest of President Reif around the work of the future. Uh, my own work has particularly focused on the geography of innovation and looking at manufacturing particularly um, and the sort of geographic distribution of manufacturing over time. All right, and then uh, Dwayne Bonning, uh, among his roles, he is the engineering lead for the uh, Leaders for Global Operations program. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Dwayne Bonning, a faculty member in electrical engineering and computer science, which now means I'm a member of both the School of Engineering and the, the new Schwarzman College of Computing. Um, I'm actually here right now playing hooky from the staff meeting for uh, one of the undergrad subjects that I'm uh, 
just recently got hooked into about uh, last semester, which is uh, 6036, Introduction to Machine Learning. Mm -hmm. uh, as a measure of how big a class that is, the staff meeting has 60 people <laughs> oh in my it. Oh, gosh. Uh, between the faculty, TAs, and lab assistants wow. for, for the class. Uh, so a very, very uh, lot of appetite uh, amongst our students uh, for that class. And by the way, there are 50 cross-registered Harvard students <laughs> uh, wow. uh, also in that class. So my, my uh, research and graduate role is really on uh, manufacturing research. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the co-director, together with a counterpart from the Sloan School of Management, uh, uh, as the faculty co-directors for this Leaders for Global Operations uh, program, which is a dual master's of engineering, uh, uh, master's of science in engineering, and an MBA with students who have about four to five years of experience as practicing engineers and come back uh, to MIT uh, and do a six-month thesis project amongst all their classes uh, in one of the 25 uh, member companies. So that's, that's uh, given us a, a really interesting lens into what's happening uh, now in that in industrial sector. All right, so as you can see, a, a pretty good group. We can go from the factory floor to the classroom to the Roman Forum uh, and all the way back. Um, so I think I'll start with uh, a, a question for Duane, um, which is, you know, as so the Leaders for Global Operations program brings people from around the world to MIT to learn how to uh, manage and improve large scale among the manufacturing operations and other businesses. Are you seeing AR, VR, sensing starting to creep into what you're teaching them? Um, is it a topic that, that is coming up in the curriculum as, as they come to MIT? So uh, we have made substantial educational changes in the last two, two and a half years uh, in the program. I would say uh, it's an eye opener on the AR and VR front, uh, but certainly in the uh, other areas of Industry 4.0 that, that, that we heard about uh, a little bit earlier in the kickoff, that's having a profound effect on, on uh, the education. So starting about uh, three years ago, all of these practicing engineers, many of them chemical engineers or aeroastros, come back and then as part of their summer curriculum, they now have a class in Python and then a class that includes statistics and, and machine learning. Um, so we are seeing that educational need, and it was driven by the need to educate these leaders, uh, both for their thesis projects, but for, for the, for the long-term long future. Uh, uh, absolutely, the hunger in the, the companies we've been interacting with and the projects that they're doing to really learn how to effectively use uh, machine learning or more broadly uh, machine intelligence is, is equal to that on the undergrad, um, undergrad side. I'm curious to know um, how you would uh, respond to something that Brian has described, which is that you can think of factories today as, or manufacturers today as, as a, a factory as a place that makes things, but also as a place that produces data. And that data, you know, data has always been part of that, but it maybe has been held captive. The technologies today now allow us to maybe bring that data out, either from machines across one enterprise or from the same machine across multiple enterprises, giving an advantage to either the manufacturer or the supplier of the tool sets. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a common characteristic that we're seeing that both new sensing is moving into the, into the factories and broadly into operations, uh, whether it be supply chain, uh, uh, fulfillment centers, uh, or the factory, the factory floor. But I think something that did strike me in the keynote earlier is the most common characteristic we're seeing in the, say, the thesis projects that the students are going into is that the companies have a lot of data and they're asking the question, uh, how can we get more value out of this? We haven't been doing enough with that data. We'd like to actually be able to make better decisions with it. And the playbook for how to do that is not been written yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been written yet in industrial practice. Everybody's you know, still exploring and trying pilot projects, uh, and it hasn't been written yet on the educational uh, front. I think that's a good, um, a good segue to Liz, because we can also sort of flip the equation and, and think about what the implications are for those whom we ask to make. Um, you know, the workers in the manufacturing economy. And I, I did take a look at the, the task force and I was struck by what seemed to be central to it, which is that there's um, 
capitalism must, in the U.S., must address the interests of workers as well as shareholders. Can you talk a little bit about the report and, and that sentiment? <laughs> yeah, that, that caught some eyes, actually, to have us uh, lead with, with some of that recommendation. So, in fact, um, we just came out with this report on September 10th. I hope everyone will take a look. It's, we've called, the, the initiative's called Work of the Future, and we weren't trying to be just clever and not uh, and different than you know future of work. The point here was to say the issue for us going forward is not will there be work. Uh, the issue is going to be what is the quality of that work. What is the accessibility of that work? And when I think I think when President Reif launched this effort, um, it's a task force of. 20 plus faculty across all five schools, um, co-led by my colleagues David Otter and David Mindell, uh, economist as well as a historian and aero astro engineer. And um, the point was to say, okay, MIT, we're very, of course, we're leading in, we're lean in on all of the technology and the adoption of it and the importance of it for solving the world's problems. But what about all of the anxiety and, uh, and uncertainty that this causes as well for workers? Why? You know, what is MIT's response to that? And so uh, we've done an interim report of the last year based on some of the research that's been ongoing at MIT. And what the point that we make here is um, despite you know, the full employment that people see here and, and very strong markets as well in Europe and elsewhere, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And if you are somebody who has, have, has less than a two-year college degree, you have good reason to be anxious because for all of the productivity growth that we've had, and it hasn't been as robust as we you know, would like after post-World War II, um, you have not seen your wages increase at all for the last 40 years, modestly, really. Um, and so that's a, you know, th that segment of the population is quite concerned. And technology, of course, is not the only aspect here. There's, got, there's trade, there's in, you know, weakening institutions for workers. Um, but on the whole, um, technology has exacerbated inequality. And it's, we've got a lot of growth in high-skilled work, a lot of growth in low-skilled work, um, and a loss of jobs in the middle. Um, but the pro, you know, the, our, our work actually points to what we call tempered optimism um, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, we've got demographics working probably you know, at our backs. We've got um, an aging workforce. We've got um, in declining fertility rates, more educated cohorts coming up, and obviously in decreasing or constrained immigration laws. Um, and so what we're seeing, and when I sort of get down to what's, what we see on the ground in terms of the firms, is that, in fact, automation is helping people uh, because they can't find workers. Our future challenge is going to be that we'll have a scarcity of workers, uh, not necessarily an abundance of workers. But, but we're going to have to use technology and use institutions to try and support the workers who are most vulnerable to this technological change, to some of this, which is what we see is really people, people between high school and a four-year degree. And um, when we've been out in the field on the sort of in the manufacturing front, we've been meeting with small and large firms, uh, both in manufacturing as well as in warehousing logistics, also in um, mobility writ large, sort of autonomous vehicles. I say similar to what you're, you're seeing, Dwayne, a tremendous amount of investment in collecting data and uncertainty in how to use it. So large firms who are at the, you know, scale matters here. We see Amazon being able to... Um, use a lot of this uh, technology. We see agricultural firms doing this. We see some of the manufacturers. Um, they're able to really um, generate a lot of data, but figuring out how to use it has been second, you know, the big challenge. And I think personally, I don't know how you feel about this, but the concern about, you know, are the robots coming? What we say in the report is, you know, they're not coming overnight. Uh, they're not necessarily coming for your job. Uh, it's, this is a very slow process. And, um, and we have, I mean, obviously we're a very strong economy right now, but we haven't found any firms where they have, you know, largely haven't seen replacement of workers. We've seen, again, sort of replacement of tasks and redesigning work for workers to move them around in different ways. So the robotics, you know, industrial robotics is, what, 20, 30, 40 years in the making here. Right now the collaborative robotics are really coming in and trying to figure out how to augment workers. And um, for some of the... Other technologies, the you know, software-related technologies, just early, early stage of figuring out how to address quality um, and how to address, you know, certainly with augmented reality, how do we bring that in? Because we have a shortage of workers, how is it going to help us train more uh, people at, you know, at, a, at a higher scale? I had wondered about that, whether somewhere in that tempered optimism part is the ability for these 
uh, technologies to somehow help workers in that new environment rather than threaten them. That right, and you know, as every case we hear is the you know, workers, you know, understandably are feel threatened by the technology coming in, but firms that are successful at this figure out how to make sure workers understand the value of it for them, and that's really what it what is required to make that happen. That we're not saying that low-paid work won't be replaced. Uh, you know, we have seen for particularly routinized work and particularly in warehousing that those jobs are at risk, but but certainly with the AI software-related work. You know, this is the first time we have uh, automated technology that's, that can affect high-skilled work, high-educated work, and lower-educated work, you know, across the board. And the feeling is that certainly with more education, this becomes a tool, not, uh, not something that displaces work, but actually augments workers. So that's, you know, that's the tempered optimism, I think, that, um, that's been born out of the work going on on this campus. Thank you. Um, Admir, if I, if I have it right, you use cutting edge technology today to study the cutting edge technology of 2,000 years ago in order to get to the cutting edge technology of tomorrow. Kind of up, sum it up. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm, what I was intrigued about in your presentation and in knowing you is that um, you use some of the tools we're talking about today both to do your work but to convey your work oh, yeah. to others and make it understandable. Can you talk <clears throat> about that a little bit? I don't know. That's, they, a, that's a good um, uh, um, good. Uh, uh, point you make. Uh, we, we, we try to uh, face the problem that Brian nicely presented in his, uh, one of his slides. And the problem is that we are actually having these amazing tools that produce a lot of data and uh, open a great uh, uh, window to worlds, uh, nano world, uh, ancient world, and everything that we do put in these uh, microscopes. The problem is that uh, we need to learn how to handle those that information and how to extract uh, the, the juice that we would like to then uh, use. And that's my materials, uh, uh, material scientist perspective, and that's the challenge that we are tackling uh, using the uh, most advanced tools, including uh, some sort of uh, machine learning of images of complete, complete mess of Roman concrete that comes to us after 2,000 years sitting somewhere in the in the archaeological side, you know, it's a challenging problem. Mm. Uh, so, and not, uh, not that's like uh, extreme if you think about normal Roman concrete that is already complex, uh, normal concrete that is already complex uh, by itself, and we are still trying to understand what is going on in our buildings right now. Uh, so, but, but the, what, what I really aim to, to actually uh, do in the lab is to somehow create uh, uh, packages that are uh, understandable uh, and can be uh, correlated with other fields. It's really an interdisciplinary work. And this uh, aims, for example, to use those complex uh, spectra and spectroscopic data to inform the archaeologists or uh, curators in the museums how to actually preserve or understand ancient technology, but also uh, somehow take uh, uh, the, the knowledge of that, uh, of those uh, from these images, and project perhaps uh, uh, and, and translate some of the features of these ancient materials into modern uh, uh, applications. And eventually, eventually it would be really nice, and that's my attempt of today. I hope you have these uh, postcards uh, with you and uh, trying the app. But the fact is that we need to also learn how to connect with the general public. And I think uh, that's uh, uh, for uh, for the little, this niche where I operate uh, is a huge challenge. I mean, uh, people uh, uh, analyzed objects for uh, you know th hundreds of years, you know, and, but but uh, often these analyses would end up in uh, in uh, drawers, and uh, yeah, let's just keep it there and maybe publish a paper. But now there is this opportunity to visualize images are are definitely the the mean uh, to uh, to tell a better the story that is behind these objects, but also connect with the public that doesn't need to understand Raman spectroscopy. Someone mentioned it today. I mean, uh, yeah, it's great. And I, I spent entire my life looking at these spectra. But the fact is that now these Raman spectroscopy images could tell the story. And that's the attempt uh, that I think uh, we should uh, try to put. And of course, uh, Somewhere in between, so research and the general public, there is education. 
that is such a uh, beautiful niche to actually uh, use these tools and and uh, inform our students so that they they have uh, tools uh, to to visualize uh, concepts more than uh, just uh, uh, write them on the blackboard. Vladimir and I have a dream of a virtual full-scale Roman aqueduct running through the courtyard of MIT Nano. Yeah, Stay we are working on that. We are working. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, have a, you have a show up right now at the Egyptian Museum in Turin. Correct, yeah. Right, through January, if you're in Italy. Um, mm -hmm. Have you gotten any feedback from how those visualizations are uh, being received by the visitors? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this uh, uh, beyond visible, uh, invisible archaeology, that's how they call it, uh, has uh, an amazing success. Uh, I must say numbers duplicated in terms of visits to the, to the museum. But, uh, but what I do have, and that's the, probably the best feedback, I was there a month ago or so, and, uh, and I have a video of two kids, literally. They were like 10 and 8, uh, downloading the app in the museum and playing with the model, like instantaneously. So, so there is this uh, new generation that will become familiar with everything with what for us is now uh, still kind of, uh, and, and it's just gonna take over and allow us to explore dimensions that we've never been uh, able to uh, access. I think you have handed me a, a perfect bridge over to uh, Megan and Russ. Um, I think we'll skip you for a minute, Russ, and go to Megan. So, Megan, you're helping, nothing personal. Megan, you're, <laughs> you're helping to launch the Immersion Lab at MIT. Um, and as part of that, you've been listening on campus. Brian referred to that. So what are you hearing, right? What are, what are, what are the opportunities for MIT in developing this laboratory? So, um... The opportunities are really broad, and I think that's very exciting. Um, we heard from people all across campus who are interested in doing teaching and research as it relates to immersive experiences. And underneath the very broad umbrella of immersive experiences, it includes AR and VR. It also includes you know, completely sound, spatial type, like I think we heard about earlier today. Um, and it includes you know, like large-scale video projection. It just includes a lot of different things. And I think, um, you know, teaching is sort of, you can think about how teaching might go in virtual reality or augmented reality or a simulated environment. But when you open it up to also research, it just, it's like, it's like a fractal. It just goes in every direction you could possibly imagine. And then once you go in all those directions, it goes in every direction again. And it's like, um, you know, people want to do research on, on um, the, the hardware, I guess, that would play into AR and VR, so displays and sensors, and uh, that kind of stuff maybe ties in very directly with MIT Nano. But then there are people who want to do research in um, inside of virtual reality, if you put humans through an experience, how do the humans respond? So maybe that is physiological monitoring, but maybe it's also looking at this psychological experience of going through the simulated environment. And so this is, I think, in some ways, it's, we're at a point where we have the ability to start to do these experiments, maybe, that, that hasn't been available until very recently. And so that's really exciting. Um, the other thing I would add is that when, I think when MIT Nano was originally conceived, Vladimir, you can correct me, but you, know, you can look around campus and you can say, okay, well, you know, there's gonna be people in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, you know, probably physics or mechanical engineering, they're gonna to come to Nano and they're gonna build stuff, they're gonna image stuff in the basement. We've got great crowd TEMs downstairs for the biologists. But when we opened the door and said, oh, also we're building a visualization lab, we started getting people from global languages, Aero Astro, um, EAPS. I mean, these are departments that, that don't do Nano. And especially in the, on the science side, like uh, Aero Astro, I mean, they're, we're talking like huge. <laughs> it's going like 10 to the 9th in the other direction, right? <laughs> Maybe more. Um, and so I think what really surprised me was that the Immersion Lab is actually, I think, where we start to bring in the other half of campus that isn't nano, per se. Um, and then you start, you actually find some interesting parallels where with nanoscientists, we're interested in taking tiny, tiny dimensions and making them human scale to get better inference about what's going on in that scale. But it's not that different from people in you know, astrophysics or aeroastro. They want to take huge and bring it to human scale, and they want to get their own inference. And it, it is like you, we now have the ability to kind of be scale agnostic, and that's really exciting because um, you, can, you, can just, like, you can start to really visualize, really try to understand things on a 
in a new way that hasn't necessarily been available before. And the languages folks, they want to you know, give students the immersive experience of going to Japan if they're in a Japanese language class. And if you can marry that with AI, then maybe you can interact with a Japanese language bot. And, th and that's a new way to learn language that we really haven't had available before. So I, I think it's very exciting. I, um, I, I was struck, if you came to MIT in 1956, the mechanical engineers had their set of tools and the urban planners had their set of tools. And increasingly, they're using the same tools, right down to languages. And I, I've been fascinated bringing people around and watching architects come in and use, or at least can't wait to use the Immersion <laughs> Lab yeah. and other disciplines. Russ, you have had 10 years at Harvard, or a little more, um, building a facility for this purpose. How have you seen it evolve from your time when you first arrived to what you have now in, in terms of both research and education for Harvard? Sure. Um, in fact, it has to be predicated by the, some of the time that came before that. Um, I first um, took a research position here in 1979 in the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And when I think about the problem sets that we were looking at then in terms of, again, application of visualization to both research and teaching um, versus the problem sets we have now, you see a certain amount of continuity that the problem sets haven't changed that much um, over time, but the opportunities for solutions have. Um, we have more and more solutions constantly. Um, and I think um, it really the two, what's interesting to me about um, having, and I was, I did like 15 years at MIT at that time and now 10 years down the river, um, is the, um, the commonality of the, um, of the tool set, as you were just mentioning, that these are universal tools. Um, people always are trying to say, well, what's the, the thing which is going to cause VR, AR technology to take off or go mainstream or become exceptional? And um, I always have to sort of dampen that down and say, no, if, you're, if you want to look at the future, you first have to look at the past because we live at a set of very long projected curves and vectors and very little pops up out of nowhere. Um, almost everything has precedent and history. And um, part of my charter over the time has been to be anywhere from five to 10 years ahead of everyone else, sort of being out there exploring and coming back with the arrows in your back and sort of saying what the problems and issues are going to be, how can you prepare for those, but also what are the opportunities going to be? And how do you prepare for those that are coming as well? And um, it's interesting that um, I have a lot of students who do this. In fact, we're going to have a lot of students come into the open houses. Um, they come into my, my lab, which is full of literally the, his, the whole history of this technology, but also a lot of books on virtual reality, augmented reality, the whole sort of idea of visualization. And they look at the equipment, and they don't look at the books. And I sort of query them, and it seems that in their mind, they can't conceive that books will carry the kind of information or learning that they want, um, which, of course, is, as we know, not a good position to take. Um, and in fact, what I point out to them is that the majority of the books on this technology and the best ones were written in the 1990s. Um, and they say, well, how can a book on technology written in the 90s have any relevance today? And a lot of it is because of how this arc on visualization technology has emerged. It used to be um, slower, more expensive, and difficult. Now it's cheaper, faster, better. Um, in the 90s, um, for example, a virtual reality headset was about $20,000 um, just to have one of them. Um, now they're $200 uh, for the same or better quality. Um, but the interesting thing is at that time, we still had a lot of very intelligent people who were thinking about these problems. But most of what they were doing was thinking. They had to do thought experiments. They had to say, what would happen if we did this or if we had that? And they were able to explore these sort of thought vectors um, very effectively without having the ability to proof it, ground truth it, as it were, with the actual tools. Now we're in a situation where the tools are cheap, they're ubiquitous, they're um, distributed in ways that are often misleading, i.e. most of the people would say the leading edge for VR and AR is in the gaming industry. Um, and um, I think that's a, a misnomer, but that's the common perception. So, it's this idea that now we do it, but don't think about it. Then we couldn't do it, so we had to think about it a lot. <laughs> so the people who wrote that down have now really done us a great favor. Um, and you can basically go back to anything that anyone says in a blog or a writing 
I have just done the first of this, or this is the initial of this, and go, no, it's not. There's 10, 20, 30 years of history of that, which they don't know. So I'm always encouraging them on the history side, and we share actually a common interest. I've been doing visualization for archaeology for that same sort of 40 years. How do you take very abstract information, very visually rich, uh, very dense in context, and, um, and then present that in a way that's understandable to either students or to other researchers who don't have your background or uh, sort of felicity in the particular field. That's continuing today, that we're still doing that to a great extent. In fact, the most advanced course that I support right now um, at Harvard is a course um, in Egyptology. And this is a, a fairly small area at Harvard, um, but um, it's a very interesting one. It's a very challenging thing to reach so far back in history. Most of our work is four and a half thousand years ago um, and bring that data in a viable, intelligent way into the present, um, display it and show it. And a good example of how all this works is that we're using um, front projection, 8K 3D, we're using immersive um, headsets, uh, we're using 360 um, videos with the students. But the kicker is we're joining a parallel class in China at the same time. So we've got students in China, students at Harvard studying the same subject, one professor, 360 headsets, cameras in both places. We can say, everybody, put on your headset now, show them a 360 image inside a particular tomb, bring them back out of the headset, discuss what they just saw, flip over, go to front projection, 8K 3D, take them on an immersive walkthrough of something else, come out of that simultaneously on two different parts of the world at the same time. And we sort of culminated that last fall. In fact, we'll be doing it again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, um, whereby we took all the Chinese students and made them avatars. We took all the Harvard students, made them avatars. We made the professor an avatar. And then we took all of them and put them in virtual reality models of the tombs and temples at Giza outside Cairo. And Peter Manueli and the professor was able to lead a joint tour with all 40 students through the virtual space with all the students with him able to see, talk back to each other in real time. So one group of students in China, one group in America, together they're in Egypt four and a half thousand years ago on a field trip. If you have a chance. That's when visit. all the pieces start coming together. And you realize that this is a cumulative idea. Um, when you sum these things together, one plus one equals x plus x, we don't know what that number is, but we know it's greater. And that's one of the things that we're learning now is what is that multiplier that these um, technologies provide you when you bring them together. I, if you have a chance to visit Russ at Harvard, it is an incredible facility. And in particular, we got to see when we visited the first time, or at least I was with you for my first visit, um, those models of Egypt. Um, and and you, have, you kind of have to see it to, to believe it. It's just amazing. <laughs> so especially when you're a regular tourist. In reality, you can't stand on top of the tallest pyramid uh, like you can in <laughs> Russ's visit. Um, it's I, kind of a superpower in a way that um, we can transport students anywhere in the world, in anywhere in time. That's a broad statement, but it's true. And that's phenomenal to people who are trying to comprehend very different subjects, very complicated subjects. If you can put them there, you're looking at the, the wall paintings in a tomb in Egypt, or we're teaching French and we take them to Paris. Um, we let them walk around, listen to native um, speakers. Um, these are things we couldn't do before. And so we're trying to understand how do you first do it, then in an institution or like MIT or Harvard, how do you distribute that? How do you make it available to a wide range of students? What's the support mechanism that's involved? What is scalable? What's not scalable? These are important questions. I was going to move into, I thought, um, after these introductory questions, it would be a chance, perhaps, for the panel to ask questions among themselves, if you had some. I don't know, Brian, you were just. I did have one question in terms of, I mean, that's a, a great success story. You know, where has it not worked well? What are the pitfalls that we can now point and say, hey, we need to avoid this space or this? an education innovation that needs to go companion with sort of a technology innovation um, when, when looking at how to do either remote collaborative touring of Giza versus, I mean, where, where, where has it broken down for you? I think it's in the, the communication of expectations that the problem we have today with a lot of this, and we read about it to a, a very shallow level, we form an expectation. And often that expectation is, is wrong. It's, it has basically underlying problems to it. But we tend to act on those expectations. So some things that you would think would work don't, in fact, work. 
Um, one of the biggest ones right now is, and why I, I man, main a facility, maintain a facility that has um, traditional projection, although at very high resolution in 3D, and the immersive technologies, is that within the immersive world, we cannot provide the resolution that we can outside of the immersive world right now. On flat panels, on projection, we can get much more quality in the imagery than we can in the headsets. But those flat panels do not transmit the sense of immersion, of being there. And so one of the things we look at when, we're, when professors are coming to say, we can, can we use this, is it applicable, is what are their goals? What are their expectations for the students in the class? Is it to experience something they couldn't experience before? Is it to see something they couldn't see before? And those are clearly two different goals. And it really follows you down two different paths of um, technology. Which is what's exciting about the, um, the Immersion Lab is as a general purpose facility operating at a very high level, you get to see that range of opportunity and to say, well, that's a great problem set, it's a great application, you need X plus Y plus Z. The next person comes in and says, now that's also a very interesting set, but you don't need that X, Y, Z, you need the ABC set of technologies blended to serve your needs. And I think the, the learning about that is, there's not literally a textbook to go for that, it's a lot of experiential learning is to figure out how to um, sort of look and analyze a problem that's presented to you and figure out what is the correct solution set to offer them. And is that offerable today? Or is it say, that's great, but we can't get to that for another couple of years at your level of expectation for your students or your research. When to say no is probably the hardest thing. Everybody wants to try it, experiment, but in many cases you can say, that's a great idea, come back in two years and we'll be able to do what you want. You would have a lot easier time, Megan, if you just kept saying that. <laughs> Dwayne wanted to follow up. Yeah, I wanted to uh, both go to Brian's question, but also reinforce a, an earlier point or the experience that Russ mentioned. Uh, we had a thesis project, an LGO thesis project that was published in a thesis uh, last year. Uh, Tim Markhart uh, did his uh, six-month internship at Raytheon uh, in Tucson, and his project was about cave technology. They were doing a massive upgrade of, of, of their cave, but also exploring uh, AR for, for training uh, and other sorts of applications. And the most amazing result, at least to me as an engineer, was that the big learnings were not on the technology side out of that project. Essentially, the most valuable use of the cave, and they expanded and doubled the use of this with, with great success, is bringing large groups of people together, so it's teams of 10 or 15, in the immersive environment, but also not all immersive in one 3D model, but with all of the different kinds of aspects of a project review, a gate review, a, a design review of how they were gonna refit a factory. Uh, and there was all these different kinds of information all the way around them, and they would go through the social aspect of integrating different pieces of information that the humans were uniquely good at, but that was so different from a team of 15 people watching somebody hit one PowerPoint slide at a time, mm -hmm. right? It was integrative and immersive of all different kinds of data, and it made me realize, again, as, as an engineer, engineering is a social activity, and I think we've got to, uh, I, to echo the earlier point, there's this amazing social aspect of these technologies that we also still uh, need to learn how to, how to utilize, not just in our classroom, but even uh, you know, in, our, in our firms and businesses and activities. One of my most interesting of, um, we talked talk about the five schools here and the 12 schools at Harvard, is the school that has presented me with some of the most interesting challenges has been the Divinity School, <laughs> right? Now, everybody thinks That's they can do visualization, but when the Divinity guys shows up, it gets much more interesting <laughs> um, because their notion of what's real and what is not real, um, what is imaginary and what is not, is quite different. And I had several, a couple instances that really showed this. Um, there's a knock on my door, said um, somebody's coming over, and it turned out to be six Sri Lankan monks. <laughs> and they came over and said, we're interested in using the visualization facility. And I said, fine, what do you want to do? They said, we want to meditate. I said, okay, that's an interesting use. Uh, certainly it's quite common and popular right now, the whole sort of mindfulness uh, thing. And I said, well, okay, put them in headsets, we get together. He said, now where would you like to meditate? I said, you can go anywhere in the world and probably to a great distance in any period of time. And they, they said, well, I don't know, show us some examples. 
So I sort of think, well, they want to meditate. Let's take them to um, a nice, quiet uh, grove in a forest. Let's take them to a beautiful beach. Let's take them up on a mountaintop. And they're going, no, no. And as we are moving in the virtual world, we go periodically through a sort of home space before we load the next. It's like loading the next program on the holodeck. And we went back to the home space, and actually it was clouds. And as soon as they saw the clouds, they said, that's it. We want to be in the clouds. So every Friday they would come in, and I would basically put them in the headsets, levitate them up into the clouds, and they would meditate. And about an hour later, they would come back down from the clouds and say, thank you very much, and they would leave. And I went, well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, another one is we've gotten a lot of interest in virtual pilgrimages. Um, people who want to go to visit the Golden Temple uh, in India. People who can't go to the Hajj uh, but are interested uh, to walk the Camino Royal. And um, so we can do that. We can virtually now with 360 video, um, you can accomplish many of these pilgrimages on a pretty much a one-to-one -one scale. It was interesting last year, someone had the nerve to sort of nudge the Pope and say, does a virtual pilgrimage count? He took less than two seconds and said, yes, it's intent that matters. That's good. Uh, very smart. Well, that's he's, very interesting, he's, he's right? Um, so this definitely something that you know, can, is applicable to a, a very wide range of areas that you don't expect. That's one of the best parts of the job in a lot of ways. I'm curious, just maybe for anyone here, but what do we know about the science of learning? behind um, you know, these types of technology. I know that John Gabrielli, who's on our task force and part of the brain and cognitive science, would say, you know, we've studied a great deal about how infants and children learn, but we know very little about how adults learn, particularly at different stages of life. And if we think about you know, uh, changing jobs and lifelong learning and all of that, is there any sense of um, an emerging you know, science of how this technology is um, absor uh, sort of adopted or absorbed by adults? I would say, um, yes, although I would say it's less a science than a blend of science and art at this mm. point. Um, I can run 800 to 1,000 students a semester through my virtual reality classroom, if covering maybe a dozen different courses, and been doing this now for many years, so I've seen literally thousands of students go through it, with virtually no empiric observation. And the reason is we don't have anyone who's trained to observe the learning process when you mix it with these alternate realities. Mm -hmm. You bring in the traditional observers of education, and they're totally confused as to what they're supposed to be paying attention to. Um, and so we're actually struggling. There is in the Graduate School of Education, Professor Chris Deedy has been working for a number of years on this issue of how do you evaluate the actual impact that these are having on people, whether it's um, training, whether it's learning, whether it's just um, a sort of um, a general experiential fun, as it were, type of thing. Um, there's not enough emphasis on that right now. It's one of the, the areas that I really complain about all the time is I would really like someone to explain empirically what I know anecdotally. Right. We call it, we're calling it essentially the Wild West right now in terms of the types of education or courses that are emerging, right? We've got badges, we've got boot camps, we've got um, three-month programs, we've got six-week programs, and there's no evaluation as of yet as to, you know, well, how does that compare to getting an associate's degree or something like that? So that's a very important area, and in fact, JPAL here yeah, is no, focused no. on trying to um, create some um, randomized control trials and study that. Yeah, I may, uh, might add on this, uh, when we talk about uh, not so much virtual reality and immersion, but flipped class mm -hmm. is an uh, interesting concept that we do practice here at MIT. I think it's very uh, empowering in terms of uh, learning. But also, uh, I think uh, digital learning itself uh, in a form of micromasters uh, uh, is something that, uh, again, it's, it's it be in between space. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, uh, results are quite stunning uh, when it comes to uh, outreach. So how, much, how many people uh, actually apply to MicroMasters? And, uh, and uh, it's, it's stunning. Uh, we, we have uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, I, I can talk about refugee program that I mm. launched here, which for me was like uh, eyes opening in a sense that Currently, I have uh, students studying MicroMasters. I don't know where they are. <laughs> I don't know uh, how they do this, but they are actually passing MIT uh, uh, edX uh, and uh, MIT X courses and uh, acquiring certificates that will probably guarantee them a very a better future, which uh, is really, uh, I think, uh, the, 
the importance of what we are talking about here uh, in empowering a uh, global uh, um, uh, pool of, uh, of learners that then uh, uh, yeah, will or will not uh, be able to access, but still uh, turns out from this very preliminary experience in open learning that, that they do go for it and they are quite successful in it. Yeah, right now there's a lot of discussion. We we're talking a lot with um, uh, Bharat Anand, who's uh, essentially did um, Harvard HBS X and now Harvard X and um, with Sanjay here at yeah. Open Learning about extension because one of the first things when he started doing this China class, there could be more than one class on the other end. <laughs> you can have n number of classes on the other end. There this can be exponential. hundreds or thousands of students simultaneously right. and not just looking at a little um, window on a laptop but actually immersed in the material in I real think, time. I think the, ch the challenge for Educators, right? It's been said that to do an hour lecture, and it'd be interesting to sort of informally survey this, but to do an hour worth of content in the classroom takes eight hours of your time, right? To really pull that solid hour together. And that's presumably you're doing either chalk and talk or sort of a PowerPoint. Now I have to worry about full sensory immersion, <laughs> and, and you know, how long does that hour of immersive content take <laughs> as an educator? And, and so I, you know, I jokingly asked that, but you know, I think one of the things that, that Megan had articulated, and I sort of uh, stole it and would put it on the slide, was you know, what, what is the role that MIT can or should take in terms of, of making some premium content available in, in some areas, and whether we can do the OCW or the edX platform for immersive educational content, right? Because it, it's gonna be laborious and time consuming. We wanna make sure that it, it has measurable output. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you one quick thing about that, because I really con have been concerned about this my whole time with this is, um, how do you cut this down so that the amount of time of preparation is equal to the amount of delivery time, which is really the goal? And what I think about is the difference between radio, TV, and movies um, to produce an hour of content. Um, for a movie for an hour, it takes a couple of years, hundreds of people. A television program takes a matter of weeks and, and dozens to 100 people. Radio, you can walk in the room, turn the mic on, and produce an hour of content in an hour. And you're done. And that's a very interesting you're learning You're really thing. good. Okay. Yeah, well, if you do it every day. And you whatever. practice a lot before. You practice a lot. Yeah. But what we've translated that into, it used to be that you had the, the research projects were using the um, sort of advanced technology, the actual software that was using for doing the research. And then the instructor would summarize that research on a PowerPoint, then deliver it to the class. And what we've decided is can we just shorten that and bring the class directly to the research technology? So instead of um, taking uh, PyMol for the life sciences or Ge uh, GeoCAD for the um, earth sciences and summarizing it, we actually put the students in the live program in the class in real time so that the professor's research is actually there. He can show what he's doing, actually modify it in front of the students in real time or allow them to interact with the real data. So by the end of the class, he's taught the lesson in a way that actually happened in front of them and is preparing them to themselves use that own, their own software later on as they move from freshman to sophomore to postdocs. So if I may, you wanted to follow up? I wanted to just follow up on Brian's point a, a little bit and reinforce it and then broaden it a little bit maybe and, and ask Liz's thought on this, which is first off in that, in that same project I mentioned, we'd, uh, the student had looked at Raytheon at virtual reality for training, and the conclusion was uh, it's going to cost way too much. It's going to be too hard. I don't have the, the scale at which to make it make sense. My process changes, and now I have to reproduce all of that. So I think opportunities for both cost but also scale, whether it's in MIT or other entities, to bring this kind of training, education, and technology out to the workforce. But I broaden it. It's not just the VR and or AR uh, kind of technology. But I think, um, you know, if I think of the workforce of the future, it's mostly going to be the workforce of the present. Yeah. But they right. got to learn more things, and and that's going to be a huge challenge. How do we uh, augment their capabilities uh, to deal with data, mm. to deal with? Uh, uh, new technologies and so on. I think it's going to be crucial for us to think hard. How do we, uh, places like like MIT and Harvard, work with uh, corporate partners and others in order to really 
uh, address what's going to be an accelerating need, I, I think, in the workforce. I mean, yeah, are you seeing right. this well, in, in companies? Well, you... well, certainly what we've seen, you know, it, um, the data up until a decade ago showed that corporations on the whole were not investing a tremendous amount on internal training, usually kind of relying on external entities to do that. And that has changed, right? If you look at Amazon, you look at others who have announced, there is just no way they can uh, they can't do this you know invest and do this so we're we're seeing a lot of step stepping up um, but I think there's a larger question as kind of societal question about this which is we really need to rethink our institutions right this is what is the role of MIT but what is the role of the community college how are they going to um, bring these new skill sets which I would agree with and like on a little bit to, to Russ's point of view like it seems to me it's not a complete um, you know, particular step change. It's a gradual, we still need, when we talk to the manufacturers, everybody still wants the fundamental skills. Nobody wants those to go away. But now we want to layer on top of it data analytics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to see this as a layering as opposed to some sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if we look at how the US, you know, what the US did to move into public education at the beginning of the 20th century, and there are huge investments to, uh, train and to educate, you know, young people uh, through high school. I think we're going to need that kind of level of thinking about new educational models for for bringing the next generation. Because we will also will need we both need those workers, and we're going to be investing. The technology is going to be so critical to actually, you know, doing all of this. It feels a little bit to me like MIT's founding, right? A new kind of university was needed to provide the foot soldiers for the industrial mm -hmm. revolution. Um, and if we're looking at new technologies and new opportunities to deploy them, we might have to rethink the system from the ground up. I would just make the point, I'm listening to all of this, that one of the messages or one of the um, visions for this work of the future was to say, how can we transform the public discourse away from technological determinism? You know, the robot's coming for my job and I can't do anything about this toward one in which we're actually driving this and leading toward you know, increased productivity, shared prosperity, et cetera. And it seems to me like there's very, like a just perfect example is the work that you all are doing about the, the, what are the problems we're going to choose to solve? What are the problems we're going to invest in? This is, these are kind of questions that when we think about what the federal R&D budget should be or where we should be investing our dollars at MIT, um, you know, how many, uh, David Mendel likes to say, how many roboticists are working on collaborative robots here at MIT? Not enough. How many brain and cognitive scientists are working on adult learning? Not enough. We, you know, there are lots of ways that we can actually start to shape the problems that we, uh, we address. I'd like to, uh, maybe we have about, what, that just jumped. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it went from 10 to 20 minutes. Um, we just went back in time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank team. you, Russ. Team, yeah. <laughs> um, why don't we take some questions from there? I'm going to maybe skip some of the questions about how UV and photochromic dyes work. That might be better to go and ask uh, Admir afterwards. And I think I don't we've think talked. It's for me, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I do want to um, talk about uh, this question be for for Megan and Brian, and so. Is the Immersion Lab going to think about uh, being inclusive towards people with disabilities? Oh, uh, I, I hope that we can be inclusive towards everyone who wants to use it. Um, and not just people with disabilities, but MIT Nano is open to MIT community, but also open to um, companies and other academic institutions that are in the area. So certainly the intent um, from the very beginning is to be as inclusive and open as an organization and also to make connections across the institute and across the community. Yeah, particularly on the disability thing um, and aging. Uh, I think this really has a lot to do with um, how we age as a population, what we're gonna do in those um, 10, 20 years that we didn't have previously. When I bring, uh, I also teach it uh, in Japan at uh, Shoji, Shoji Joji Gaku, which is Show Women's University, and when I bring the Japanese young 19-year-olds in and I show them VR for the first time, I ask them, what do you think this is good for? And they say, my grandmother. And I say, well, why is that? Well, she's 90 years old. She lives in the country. She's not very um, healthy. She can't leave the house. But she always wanted to go to Paris. She always wanted to see other parts of Japan that she never got to see. 
here's a way to do that. Here's a way for them to live a really full and interesting life. So did, I forget, somebody in the audience or up here might remember, uh, two weeks ago, the, the, MIT, uh, the MIT News, um, to, to MIT alum started a company, what was it, out of Sloan, one was... I have to find uh, it. It department. was the front page of MIT. But it basically, it was AR or VR for elderly. Um, so giving them, uh, it was in sort of care facilities. Uh, and the quote from the student or the alum was, it was the most rewarding thing that he had ever done. But basically, you know, these people that had never experienced this technology that were otherwise sort of, um, um, sort of either bedridden or chair-ridden um, got to take themselves someplace else. And we're also finding some very spectacular things about things like Alzheimer's and memory loss which is if you take those people and you immerse them back in a period where they were maturing, that is, you take them back to the 1950s or 60s, and you put them in there for a number of hours, their memories come back. It begins to trigger these deep subconscious uh, memories and brings them back to the surface. And it, it's cumulative. The more you do it, the more it rebuilds. So we're really at the edge of something that's very interesting. It also turns out that this is one of the best pain-killing devices or capabilities we've ever discovered. You can kill up to 70, 80% of all pain with a VR headset alone. Now, nobody saw this coming. This was not something that you anticipated because it was an indirect result. What happens is if someone's in a lot of pain, if you immerse them in their favorite thing, it begins to generate endorphins in the brain, and the endorphins suppress the pain. And so it turns out that you can basically take someone who's been in a burn hospital and let them go downhill skiing for an hour. They forget the pain. The pain actually decreases. So we're really at the tipping point here now of just trying to understand how powerful this technology is for disabilities, for aging, um, for disadvantaged communities. This is a very exciting area. We see it more at the Chan School of Public Health now at Harvard and, and also here at MIT. This is an underdeveloped area, which I think really needs more focus. I'm not sure if in that question there was about making the lab itself accessible to people with disabilities to use it as a facility. If, we, if that is what the question was about and you have ideas, find us afterwards. Um, we would love to know what you're thinking. I guess I would just add one thing. I mean, we had Ian here, and this, we've not yet outfitted with the auditory experience, but certainly for people with, with uh, vision disabilities, we're biased with, in terms of the screens and displays, but we will be incorporating that audio uh, immersive experience as well. I think that, um, that uh, the a Ready Player One or Matrix dystopian future may be an overly pessimistic, simplistic view, but uh, what do you see as the more likely social risks to ubiquitous VR? Ooh, I got a starting point there. I'm worried about kids. I'm worried about children. This is a very powerful technology. Where in the human evolution development process is it appropriate for kids to experience this? Um, there's very little work been done on this. And to me, it's, it's very concerning because the power of this is so strong, you really have to think about it. Um, and right, unfortunately right now, because it's focused on gaming, it actually is actually focused on this very, um, you know, this group that we should be mostly concerned about, which is kids from their, say, uh, 10 to um, 18 or 20. Um, and you really, and this stuff is so far, you don't want to see Ground Theft Auto 4 in VR, <laughs> um, even as an adult probably, much less as a child. So I would say children and how this affects the younger mind is a big part of this dealing with the dystopian future. Um, the other is that... Well, I, I, would, okay, I would just sorry, sort of, I mean, I spend so much time in front of screens, and we, we all walk around with our cell phones staring at screens. So, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not just afraid for the adults, or for the kids, I'm afraid for the adults as well, right? And so in my mind, I, we, we, we're speaking a lot about VR, virtual reality, but I, I, I hypothesize, I don't know, but... Um, that where we want to get to is actually AR, augmented reality, where you're not sort of putting the blinders on and forgetting the rest of the world, that you're, you're still able to experience the world, but with a sort of an appropriate registered aligned augmentation to it, where it's not, okay, I can get lost behind the screen. I think that, for me, seems to be far less risky, not only for the children, but for us that we're always doing this anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I would also add, um, if you are in a world where you can have any information you want pulled up in front of your eyeballs at any time, like at what point does your brain stop recording information? Like I've noticed now that I have my phone in my car, I can get directions anywhere. It took me a lot longer to learn my driving way around Cambridge after I moved back. Um, and so if you just start to take just even that tiny example and you apply it to anything else, at what point, I mean, your brain doesn't record information that it knows it can easily access elsewhere. They've shown that even like with couples, they won't remember something because they know the 
the partner will remember it for them. You know, so you, so if you just you know put your augmented reality device in in there too, I, will, I mean, how how what are we going to remember? <laughs> there, are, there are structural implications, right? The yeah. part, portions of the brain of London cabbies are bigger than for everyone else because <laughs> they're using them. Um, I'd like to turn to the questions. I'm going to hold Russ's book till the very last question. <laughs> okay. For those of you who are eagerly anticipating that. Um, I feel like the, it feels like we're still coming to terms with what is the story of MIT Nano while still communicating a story. Sort of the slam example from the morning session. What is your take? I happen to be communications director for MIT <laughs> Nano. <laughs> you take uh, hold my beer. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that, I think that I can speak on behalf of the MIT Nano in this way. I think that the story of MIT Nano has been incredibly consistent from the beginning. Nanoscience and nanotechnology are becoming increasingly central to the research enterprise at MIT, and a facility was needed in the center of MIT to support the thousands of researchers who need its tools. What we're doing right now is getting the systems up after six years of design and construction. That just got us to a building where we had the keys to get inside. The last year has been about putting in the safety systems, all of the uh, chemistry, um, like uh, effluents, and all the other things in place to safely operate, as well as the social and administrative systems to allow people to come in. Um, where we are in that story now is the first users will start to really use the clean rooms, the nanofab, uh, this semester. Since the winter, researchers have been using the uh, metrology spaces in the basement. MIT Nano is now on the road to becoming a fully operational research center, and that progress is steady. It will be slow, but you will start to see it more and more and more. The question, I think, becomes not that the story we've told so far, but when do we change chapters? Um, if you talk to Vladimir and, and Dennis and others who are behind the decision making on the tool sets, there's an open question about how much turnover should there be. How do we keep a facility like this always current so that we're rotating in new technologies as they're invented, as they're needed by the community? Um, and I think you're seeing some of that with the immersion lab. There's a little bit of overlap of building to this point and trying to build for tomorrow. Does that seem fair? And I would add to that, Tom, is so the, the immersion lab has a very strong story connected to the mission of MIT Nano, the fab users and the metrology users, to be able to visualize data at that scale, to be able to interact with data at that scale. And then the, 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 the highest level mandate is Nano doesn't own anything. We're, we're, an, we're an enabler. We're trying to make you better. And by providing the democratized access to the equipment for fabrication or for metrology, but as well with the tools that we need, so the Immersion Lab is furthermore democratized access to that say, the set of capabilities. And here we're, we're very much focusing and championing that set of technologies, but it's broadly that is the, the, the highest level mandate of, of Nano to make those tools accessible, whatever tools are that we have, both the tools and the people that we have to support those tools. I still want that virtual beer. <laughs> <laughs> so after, I will happily give you one. Um, let's see, I feel like we might have covered some of the uh, learning new skills uh, with uh, new technology and sensing. Um, is VR better suited for education than AR or vice versa is, a, is an angle that I don't think we've quite hit. Do we have an opinion on that? They're certainly different. Um, they have different sensibilities, different capabilities, as um, Brian was saying. Um, one is dealing directly with the real world, and one is essentially avoiding the real world. Um, and so I think you, they, will, they will follow different paths. They will be parallel paths to a certain extent. And the technology is merging. Um, right now, if you look at the alphabet soup of AR, VR, and you hear also MR, mixed reality, has actually been misused for the last few years because we haven't gotten to MR yet. You'll see that probably in October of next year in 2020 when uh, Apple presents us with the first true mixed reality um, headset, as it were. It actually be glasses at that point. Um, so that I, one's I would, to be I would, determined. I guess I would add a, a, as well, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, this being on sense, to bring it back to sensors right. for a moment, we don't actually have the technology yet to really have as compelling an AR experience as we do a VR experience. Because it's really hard if I'm trying to put a virtual object on that chair and we're trying to look at it together to all of us to see the same thing when we're moving around, to know where we're moving, to know where the chair is. 
That's hard. It's easy to. It's far easier to control that in a purely virtual environment mm -hmm. where you can be a little sloppier. We don't actually have the good, as robust ability to know where everything is, where you're actually gazing, and to get that, that true superposition that you need for an augmented reality instead of a... I always say we're three to five years behind, uh, that is AR is three years to five years behind VR at the moment, but ultimately has more potential impact. If it starts to become more prevalent in the educational system at MIT, how are you going to support the researchers or lecturers in improving their storytelling and making the content more accessible? So this came up actually in the needs finding because MIT people, I mean, they love to do the thing on the cutting edge, and so everybody's interested in how can I use these technologies in my teaching? Um, but we don't right now have a class on either how to make, con well, we have classes for students, but not for educators on how to make content it's VR content, um, and we don't have a class on how to teach inside of VR or AR, so that's a, a teaching skill in itself because you're not up at a blackboard, and then you, you don't even necessarily go through a linear thing of, you know, here's the fundamental, and here's an application, and here's an example problem. I mean, it could be, like Asang Yi was talking earlier today, people learn through play, and so it could be that you enter an immersive space, and there's a couple of models that you can play with, and you try to build your own intuition that way. And I, I think that there is um, a lot of research that needs to happen on what's the most effective way. And in parallel with that, we need skills about how you make the content, and then also skills about how you, you know, use the content to do teaching. So it's a need, but we don't have a specific answer for it yet. Admir, did, um, do you have a, an understanding of how um, edX, MITx helps professors? Because some of that mode was repeating what happened in the classroom, but there is a difference preparing for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are grants that are uh, out there for faculty to turn uh, into, you know, um, flip class or create content, which. Uh, Definitely facilitate. Unfortunately, faculty are very busy at MIT, <laughs> so I have not yet <laughs> applied for that. Uh, but uh, definitely, MIT is uh, is helping uh, significantly to uh, to you know uh, help you uh, in implementing some of these tools. Uh, yeah. Let me let me pull out another question that sort of follows along that. So, if the industries in this audience benefit That's from good. these technologies and future graduates, how should those industries be involved in education? Well, I, I, I would say that I, I think it has to be a little bit of a bi-directional kind of opportunity. Um, you know, I think that, that the industry's uh, programs that bring uh, learners from industry here, but almost more the, uh, the learning to be the learner, and then they go back to their, their companies and propagate the, what, what they're learning is one avenue. But I think uh, we heard about the MicroMasters, uh, I, I know Brian has been involved in a micromasters in manufacturing yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and design, as I have, and other ways to sort of get, get what we're learning to a much bigger scale uh, than yeah, the... I think that's a good point. To, to scaling is going right. to be a problem right. in both directions. No, actually, uh, contrary, I think um, what micromasters are showing is that because we have such a big pool, uh, we are benefiting from... Uh, 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 we are able to actually... Um, so let me give you another information. There is the, the amount, number of students that finish MicroMaster is really low. <laughs> so many click, and so it's a very strong start uh, at the time zero, and then it goes down. Uh, because you need to pass those <laughs> exams, and, and uh, it, they are online, but still tests, and, uh, and uh, online TAs will uh, help you, but still you need to put a significant amount of work to actually complete the MicroMaster. And this is where uh, uh, now I guess the, the question uh, comes very interesting. Will you industry recognize MicroMaster as a, as a certificate that will lead to a uh, uh, solid uh, starting point for a, for a graduate to then uh, get a um, job? which is an objective of all of us eventually, you know, to, to have these kids uh, getting great jobs. So, so I think we are uh, still working on, on evaluation, and j definitely does a great 
job in the, and there is a great MicroMasters, by the way, developed by j -Pal. Um But we are still evaluating how this certificate, the value, exact value for us as educators, having class of uh, 20,000, 50,000 students is just the next level uh, in a sense of uh, being able to, to uh, find uh, uh, interesting, interested individuals that will uh, enjoy uh, in listening to an uh, MIT or Harvard professor or whoever uh, builds a nice uh, uh, content on those platforms. I'm going to just use an anecdote that brings us away from the MITs of the world of the four-year education uh, system. I will just say we've been out in Ohio interviewing firms about their um, adoption of new technology and what it means for training. And uh, we met with one of the heads of manufacturing for the state, and he said, well, um, we're short 100,000 workers right now in the state of Ohio. I said, oh, that's a big number. When did you figure that out? He said, oh, about 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, we just didn't do anything about it. And um, part of why they didn't do anything about it was this sense of it's somebody else's problem. You know, that's not what we do. But that's, that time has changed. We now see, you know, the, certainly the manufacturers in Ohio stepping up. And so when we talk about what industry is going to do, they have to be part and parcel of partnering with the educational institutions, helping bring in with, and we can find, you know, there is money that's been uh, either at the federal level or state level, bringing in this new technology and trying to train uh, and trying to bring up systems that are, you know, training at scale. But that's the kind of thing, right, in, just in manufacturing, which of course, there is a net projection of loss of jobs, but given the uh, retiring workforce, we have a projection of about 1.5 million uh, shortage of workers in manufacturing over the next decade plus in this country. You know, this technology is going to be essential, and industry is going to be essential for training for that uh, for that uh, next generation of workers. And that's, you know, that really we need some leadership, and we're finding it, I think, in a number of different places uh, among industry. All right, I think um, we will go to our last question which is, Russ, so if we really want to get a start on learning this, what's the best book we can read from the 90s? <laughs> um, I recommend two off the top of my head, and they both um, are um, part of the MIT Press, um, so they're easily accessible just down the street. Um, one on the, the best overview of um, how this emerged, where we are today, and probably where it's going is a book by Oliver Grau, G-R-A-U, um, and it's called uh, Virtual Art. But in fact, it's more about other things than just art. It's about the whole sort of history of virtualization and how it's played out against society and culture. The second is another from a professor here at MIT, um, Janet Murray, um, who taught and ran the language program at here during the um, 70s and 80s when we first started using these technologies for teaching language. She wrote a book, great book called Hamlet on the Holodeck. And this really gets at the issue of the storytelling side, about agency, about how we as humans are going to um, work and function in this space. So I highly recommend both of those. Um, they are just as valid today as the day they were written. Well, thank you. Tom, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you to everyone for sharing your expertise and perspective.